Hi, everyone. It's Joe Venary, the host of Fit Insider, the show where I talk with the entrepreneurs, executives, and investors who are redefining the business of fitness and wellness. Today, I'm joined by Lauren Fundos. Lauren is the founder and CEO of Forte. In today's episode, I talked with Lauren about using content to scale beyond the four walls of a fitness studio, how the company created a turnkey solution for live streaming classes, and the company's plan to go beyond a marketplace and become the technology infrastructure for streaming fitness content. I had a great time chatting with Lauren, and I hope you enjoy listening. Let's get into it. Hi, Lauren. Welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Hey, how you doing? Doing great. Thanks for making some time to chat today. Yeah, super excited to be here today and chat with you. Awesome. And just to kick things off, can you tell us more about how Forte got started and what the company looks like today? Yeah. So uh, prior to starting Forte, I was uh, institutionally a bomb broker on Wall Street. So nothing to do with this uh, space, but very passionate user of the space. I actually live next to Peloton. So sort of saw that idea developing from its early days and and realized what they were doing. And I thought, wow, this would be great if we could give this to all the studios that exist and have great brands and great communities. And so I started talking to some of the studios that I was pretty close with and asking them if they wanted to stream their classes. Obviously, this is years ago. So the enthusiasm level was not as high as it is today. But I was, you know, kind of insistent that I was sure that this was going to happen, that, that, that they would want to have a digital footprint. And, you know, if even if they had a thousand locations that with streaming, a person that had one location could could expand quicker and, and you know, get a bigger community. And so at the time, I used to always use the example from Blockbuster. I'm like, you know, there's Blockbuster. There used to be Blockbuster everywhere, but now you don't see any because they didn't digitalize their business. So I used to kind of tell that story to studios to get them excited. And, and now, fortunately, you know, obviously at studios get it, which is which is exciting. So before I knew it, a couple of the studios were excited about the idea and asked, you know, when we would get started. And so at that point, I had a job and I really had no idea how to get started on what I had sort of uh, described. But I knew that this was coming and I was certain that that this was going to happen. And I didn't want to tell a story that I had this idea that I didn't invent the company about. So <laughs> From that moment on, I decided to set sail and to uh, get going and try to build this company that I was imagining to be able to empower studios to stream. Yeah, that's incredible. And I think there's a lot that we or somebody who is in the industry might gloss over. But when you say, you know, you saw this happening and you knew it was moving to the digital space and almost the the blockbuster to Netflix evolution, what were those conversations like going in and talking to studio owners who are very much focused on, you know, how do we make sure that people are there in the classes, program a great experience, make sure the yeah. the user enjoys it. And then you're coming in and telling them, listen, this is all going to start to shift. Um, how did that conversation initially start to take shape? Yeah, people were definitely super reluctant. You know, I think there was a lot of different ideas, but some of the common threads were, also down to people will copy what they're doing. People will, um, you know, that was the main concern that people would copy what was going on. And I guess my, my argument was always, if you do something in these four walls and nobody knows what you're doing, only the 25 people that are currently coming here are going to know what goes on in here. I'm like, if somebody does leave and copy your idea somewhere else and, and stream and broadcast it, then they're going to be the owner of that great idea, which was ultimately yours. So I think now, obviously, you know, with social media and, and you kind of need to put your content out there. So the world is, is changing. But then the main concern really was, was content being stolen and also cannibalizing their business, which I think if you, you know, when I used to go to Peloton in the early days, it was pretty much me and the instructor in the 5 a.m. And now every time I go, I get turned away because the classes are full. So I think that's a case where obviously, you know, people are curious what's going on in there. People want to go, the home riders want to go, people in the city want to go. So I think, you know, it's like football. It's like football's on TV. It's like people don't not go to the game because they can watch it on TV. They are more excited to go to the game. If anything, it, you know, it, it drives people into the studio for maybe the one or two that it would displace. But I think nothing's going to replace an in-studio and experience. So those were the main concerns. And I think we're also proving now that, you know, and my brother was actually a great example of this, but he, you know, thought studios were girly, kind of didn't take the classes, started streaming on Forte because obviously he's my beloved brother. And now he goes to studio classes and he loves them, but he would have never stepped foot in them otherwise. So the main concerns were those two things, which, you know, thankfully we've been able to prove that they, you know, that, that they're not, that they're kind of false. And also it, this is a big revenue source, can be a, a monstrosity of a revenue source for them as opposed to expanding necessarily all people in order. Yeah, it absolutely makes sense. And I think it's kind of 
you know, obviously proven itself out over time. When you talk about going in and, you know, convincing the studio owners and having that conversation and it kind of bearing out, what does the actual implementation look like? So now they've, they've agreed to do it and yep. you say, okay, great. What does that process look like from there? Yeah. So what kind of gets lost in our business model or our differentiator is really this technology that we spent over two years developing before we did anything else. So what we basically do is we hardwire three to five cameras in the studio walls. We put a server there on site. And then when the instructor begins teaching a class at say 12 o'clock and plugs their phone in to put their Spotify playlist on, the automation would turn on all five cameras, rotate around for that specific class at that time, and then shut itself off at the end of class. So that automation that we've developed, we call our Autobot, runs from coast to coast all day, every day, live producing classes with no human operators. And so in order for a studio to set that up, basically we have a tech server that we, that we require from them. So that ways we can integrate into their current AV setup. Initially, we thought we'd build our own setup, but then it required them having to do different things when they streamed, which, which was default, you know, was ultimately ending up with with bad streams because they weren't remembering the processes correctly. So they we integrate into exactly what their situation is. Nothing will be different on their end. The instructors can, you know, blare the music in the studio and do all the things that they want in the studio to keep the experience authentic and they can't blow out the stream or mess up the stream. Um, so yeah, it took a long time to be able to test this technology. When you live stream, you know, you require a certain amount of bandwidth up and down. Um, and when you start trying to increase the bandwidth, Verizon or whoever the you know, a provider is starts to really charge you a lot once you start upping the bandwidth. So obviously if, if studios had to pay thousands of dollars a month just for the internet, that would be, you know, a barrier to entry. So we really had to shimmy around and figure out, you know, how to make this work at a cost that we thought the quality was still extremely high, but the, um, you know, ease for the studio was, was pretty much eradicated. The, you know, cameras in Peloton, they're fixed on the wall. They have obviously one that moves on a track, but but, you know, we know what happens in the studio classes. So we work with the studios to go through what's going to happen. It's not like the classes are a free-for-all. So we know, you know, they warm up in the middle, then they go to the bar, and then they cool down in the middle again, or whatever the, whatever the setup is. So we work with them to perfect that and then to perfect sort of the production of that um, class type with the studios. And then once the instructors talk into the mic, you know, we know the decibels of their voice, they don't change. So, you know, once then when they would schedule it on our site, then when they select the class, it chooses that production. And when they select the trainer, then it, then, you know, we don't need somebody on an audio board, uh, mixing the audio there. So from the studio's perspective, it's, it's, you know, basically very simple to, yeah, nothing to operate aside from just doing a great job and, you know, creating a great class. So you've basically taken and, and created an, a turnkey process for taking that live studio class and turning it into a, you know, on-demand fitness class. Um, exactly. And on the user side, is that available live? Is it available on demand? Both. There's a library. So what am I accessing as a user when I sign up? Yeah. So everything streamed live and then available on demand seconds thereafter. If you reserve a spot for an upcoming live class, the instructor then knows you're taking it and will cheer you on. Uh, we just completed the integration of wearables. So uh, all wearables will sync to the platform and then you can obviously track yourself in real time and uh, compete on our live leaderboard. So, you know, and ultimately the goal is to continue to make it as, you know, interactive as possible. And and once the, you know, studios have the tech set up, they're creating great content every day. We advise them to stream the content that they're, that they're creating. But of course, they can use the technology to stream however they see fit. I think what's been um, really fun for us is that we realize that users actually don't like to watch a class a second time. So even if they don't catch it on a live stream, they want to go home and know that, you know, today's a different day and there you know, may, may be different people in the class or, you know, the instructor is telling the story about their apartment move or whatever they're talking about. So I thought that was super interesting. Now that our users have been exposed to not having to watch, you know, one video over and over again, they would never go back to doing that, which I thought was a really important feature of the live that maybe the stats are still, you know, kind of catching up to showing why it's so important. And do you think it's, how is that resonating differently than you kind of touched on it there a little bit watching, you know, previously you'd go and pop in a tape or a DVD, or even if you were accessing online that class one time, but now they're getting this connection to the the, certainly the studio, the instructor, even potentially people in the class. Yep. How does that kind of form the the community that is so important to fitness? People talk about 
their tribe and it resonates with them so much and it encourages them to work out, there's some concern that when you go to the streaming or on demand at home, you don't have that same community element. How have you seen that take shape? Yeah. So I think it's important to see sort of, yeah, to, to watch the trainers in there, you know, as they would teach the class, right. I think, you know, they're talking about their lives and, and kind of weaving in little stories here and there, and that's developing each day as their lives are developing. So I think that's the element that a traditional workout video sort of doesn't have. And like you said too, the same people will be in the class and stuff like that. So you, you actually feel a part of the class. You know, if you watch some studios that do produce videos, and you went to take their class, you would realize their class is quite a bit different than those videos. But I think with us, it's like, you know, if you watch it every day, you know exactly where the mats are. If you walked into the studio, you would know where the mats are. You would know where where you wanted to stand in the studio as if you'd been there every day. So I think that's, you know, what's really exciting. It's giving you the ability to actually take those classes. Um, and I, I think the other thing that Peloton's really really opened up the world to is, you know, the fact that it is a real studio and a place that you can go to. So, and we've seen the same thing of people come to New York and they want to go meet all the instructors and are so excited to see them, you know, as opposed to kind of the old days, they were filmed in a recording studio and you can't, you know, find Jillian Michaels and, you know, go see her on Tuesday morning, you know, like you can a Peloton instructor if that you watched every day. So I do think that's another element that's, that's super exciting for people to be able to yeah, make the Mecca to the studio ultimately. And yeah, see them in person. And I think that's really where that sort of, you know, sense of commitment comes from with, with that, with that aspect. Yeah. I think that's something that, you know, at least for me, even it wasn't something that I took into consideration. The thought that by streaming these classes and meeting these people and developing a relationship with them, that it would encourage me to, you know, seek them out. Or if I was there, provided the opportunity to go meet them. Uh, it's something that was echoed in a conversation. Uh, talked to Ethan Agarwal, who's the CEO of Aptive. And, yep. you know, he said, we actually do a better job of building community than some gyms because we provide access to so many different types of people that you wouldn't otherwise meet. And I think in this case, it's when would this person who's an instructor in New York ever get how would somebody in, you know, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, how would I even know this person existed, let alone know where to find them? So I think that's a really interesting community building, like kind of bonus ad for the instructors and studios. Totally. I mean, most people don't have a gas station within 20 miles of their house, right? I live in New York city on 23rd street, which is loaded with studios, but, but most people don't have that. And, And the biggest, you know, gym, one of the biggest gyms is planet fitness and they don't offer classes, right? So even the people that are going to the gym still, don't have classes available. So I think, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunity. And then there's also the 260 million Americans that don't work out, right? And are in, totally intimidated to go to these places. And this is the gateway for them to, to begin trying it. So I think there's, yeah, so many different markets. Obviously, the easiest consumer is the, you know, studio user that maybe moved to the suburbs outside of this area and misses their usual classes and totally gets it. But I think the the real market is, yeah, reaching those people that don't have access. And the bigger one is the people that are just completely frightened to actually go to a studio. Definitely. And when we were talking about, you know, the the value proposition for boutiques, I, definitely the creating an additional revenue stream, automating the process um, are two things that stand out. Do you talk about publicly what the kind of revenue share or numbers are for a partner that joins, what they can expect, um, how that's broken out? Yeah. So we pay the studio. The studio covers the cost of the technology. We don't upcharge them for that. They just cover whatever the cost is. um, And that will vary depending on the amount of cameras. And then from there, we rev share with them and we pay them out based on minutes watch per month in comparison to the total piece of the pie. So similar situation to the way Spotify does. Um, and then we also now are, um, next quarter launching basically a SaaS and white label service where we'll strip our site and they can use all the sort of interactive functionalities of the site and we'll build it and connect it into their app or site or however they want it to work. And then in that model, we wouldn't be rev sharing because we wouldn't be collecting the user revenue, but they would be then covering, um, the three variable costs for their streaming. So they would pay basically for what they use. Yeah, I think that's an incredibly smart move for you all to start developing um, basically the pipes that that run the entire system. It's yep. something that we kind of wrote about in thinking about um, who's building the or selling the picks and shovels for the future of connected fitness. You talk about so much the hardware. There's certainly Peloton being one of them, 
um, hydro, uh, et cetera, building the, the hardware, but who yep. is building, whether it's white label or back end technology that enables anybody to flip a switch and now stream classes. Um, I think that's a smart move and, and one that yeah. you've obviously identified. What was the kind of, how did that come to fruition? Was it a demand thing? Was it an opportunity that you saw and kind of pushed? Yep. I guess, I guess. So if you want to live stream classes, you can build a TV production studio as all the companies that you mentioned have done. And I think that's obviously, you know, Peloton's whole business model is the home user, right? But let's say you're a gym with a thousand locations, your, your business is your brick and mortar business for one, right? And so how do those businesses then be able to have a digital footprint without, you know, going and, and building a TV production studio, like an NBC studio. And so that was really where we set out, you know, there's a lot of companies that say, shoot it on your phone and, and, or, or you could use Facebook live, right? That's the other end of the spectrum. So there's a TV studio or that. And I was like, there needs to be something that we can create in the middle that eradicates all friction from the studio, but with the way technology is going, that should make this frictionless. And so we set out to develop something that we knew that they couldn't develop on their own for for years to come, but that also was was you know quite simple because the output is is still the same. And so um, you know there is no end to end solution. If you want to live stream, like I said, you either have to have cameras live recording it, or you have a TV studio. But but the way technology works now, you, you don't need that, right? Like I said, with the voices of the instructor, we don't need somebody on an audio board mixing those dials anymore. And so, um, yeah, automating this process for them was important for us. And, and then just leaving up to them the content creation, which is what they, which is what they do. And we currently have no competition from that um, sort of turnkey technology. So you can, you can stream live videos on many companies, right? You can use Ustream, Livestream, there's a million Vimeo, right? You can use all those, but you still have to figure out how to ingest the content and shoot it. And that's where that those companies don't solve that problem. So that's what we set out to do. And now there's you have the the kind of marketplace where people can log in and have their selection of classes. You yep. are you know obviously onboarding different studios to that uh, the other side of that marketplace as well. And now you're talking about the technology solution um, with the kind of now three prongs to the the company. Yep. From where you started initially in the vision for, hey, I think this there's change coming to the industry. Yeah. Uh, to now where things are today, how is it the same and different? Did you imagine that, or could you have imagined that it would have taken this shape? Um, and what has that journey been like? Yeah, so I think I think that from our perspective, what we sort of realized was the bigger companies want to stream their own classes to their own people, and they don't want to be a part of a marketplace. And so for us to leave that business you know, aside while we have the technology and they're seeking out a solution to do this, it just felt like we were really missing that opportunity. So that's sort of how we got to doing that. The other side of the equation is in the marketplace, we realized if we had a thousand yoga studios that the user wouldn't know which yoga studio to watch. And so from the marketplace perspective, we wanted it to be curated. And because of the demand for streaming, we have all these studios that we were saying no to. And so that was sort of, sort of how it became really evident to offer this white label solution. I do believe still wholeheartedly, though, from the user perspective, they do want Netflix, right? They want one thing with everything in it. The studios, on the other hand, would prefer to have things in their own site. And so for us, we decided to stop fighting that belief and to sort of you know, uh, fuel both business models for us because I think the big brands, like I said, they want their own product. And, and so, so that's what we'll give them because they're still looking for a solution to power it. And, and we have that answer. So that's sort of how we got to this, to this approach. And I think from the user though, you know, it's, you know, the, the, you know, you move around, right. You do bar, you go crazy spinning, then you go crazy boxing and you kind of move around. So in a marketplace, those studios could share that user as they go through that journey, which is very typical for a fitness person to move along with the trends or just, you know, discover new things and get really into them. So I do believe that they would share users and all benefit from that. But I do understand the logic of, you know, these bigger brands wanting their own product as well. Right. And that's where you kind of see looking at the landscape Initially, obviously, it was Peloton who kind of upended the category, folks following their lead in terms of hardware, a variety of audio-only classes and platforms. Now yep. you have players like 
a few months back, Equinox announced that they're going to get into the space with this kind of Project X that doesn't really have a name quite yet. Um, yep. How do you think about Forte in that broader landscape? You know, obviously a lot of the headlines are the the Netflix of fitness, the end of the gym, everything yep. is, you know, coming to an end. Oh, actually, no, we're, wow. on, we're only just getting started. Um, yep. How do you think about that? And how do you talk to your, whether it's your team or your customers um, or potentially even investors about what's going to happen as things shake out? Yeah, I think, uh, so I see our, our current product really as something you use at home, but also at the gym, you know, people are moseying around at the gym and, you know, trying to remember what to do or just using the weight machine. So I also see it as a means to, you know, using that in a hotel gym, a residential building gym and a traditional gym. So I don't think it, it, I don't think it, people are being eradicated from the home. Obviously you could totally do body weight workouts, but most people aren't going to have all that connected fitness equipment at their house, depending on where they live or what their income is. So I see the gym is still a relevant point to, to using these great streaming tools. And many gyms are also then building these streaming rooms, right? Where it's a great experience to stream and it has all the tools and you can have these classes and stuff like that. So I think from that perspective, it's going there. The other um, like very obvious angle is for the equipment manufacturers to get on board and to have the classes you know, on their treadmills and stuff like that. They don't need to go build a running studio. There's plenty of great running studios, but they should have that content on their dashboards as opposed to you know just watching the dot light up around the track. So I think connecting those um, two ends of the spectrum is really an important thing for us as well. Um, and then I think, you know, I think people still are going to go to the gym. People like to be connected to the community. I think having that touch point is still super, super important. But but then again, there's people that just don't have access to this. So um, and, and they won't get that for a while. And I think it's really important that with technology, you know, we can we can bring that to them and, and help the brands, you know, build their following. And I think that's going to be you know, exciting for the brands too, as the brick and mortar space gets, you know, super, super competitive. And, you know, uh, as things are evolving with class pass and the cost of all these places, and, you know, there's been a lot of evolution since, since all this, you know, has been going on the last couple of years as well. And I think class pass did a great service proving that people love going to studios by making it affordable to people that it maybe wasn't affordable to. And so maybe to that market, then streaming is the solution for the people that aren't willing to pay 40 or, you know, 30, in some cases, almost up to 50 now dollars a class. And with the various, when you talk about the different prongs of the business with the technology component, serving the boutiques and studios, serving the consumers, what is the makeup of the team at this point? How big are you guys? How does it break out across departments? Yeah, we're predominantly uh, engineers because because we're building a pretty technical product. So the majority of our team is engineers, and then we have you know a COO, CFO, and myself on the business side, and the rest of the team is actually all engineers. So our goal was really to build this yeah technology that that we saw the market needing. And, and when we first entered the market, you know, we were slightly early. People were not super excited about streaming. They kind of knew what Peloton was doing. They had heard about it. You know, they 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 just weren't that excited about it. But I think now it's like, you know, you need to have a good Instagram, you need to have a good website and you need to have content. And a lot of the kind of uh, bigger brands or forward thinking brands have on demand video. But what we're seeing is, you know, now that people see Peloton, right, they want to have that same experience. And, and the on demand video is also pretty costly when they shoot these videos every quarter or every month, depending on how the studio does it. And what we've seen from some of the data points we've studied is that the users want more content more frequently, but for the studio that's shooting it, it's super expensive. And so that's where then live streaming becomes an obvious next step as well, aside from the fact, obviously, it's more interactive and engaging and, you know, you could follow the stories and feel more a part of the community. So the market as, you know, at first, uh, on-demand video was where a bunch of them went to, but now I think everyone sort of gets it. And so we feel like we're in a position in a really great place right now to yeah capitalize on the excitement around the streaming and yeah to be able to basically be the arms dealer for all these studios to to get their brands out there and to do this right i think it makes sense and that's the thing that you know folks tend to overlook there's there can be a lot of hype in the system when you talk about you know what's the progress the user numbers the funding rounds and who's grabbing the headlines meanwhile you're quietly executing behind the scenes Yep. And telling this story and preparing for this shift as it's starting to happen. And now, you know, people are almost starting to catch up with you 
And as they do, you're able to say, hey, we have that turnkey option that's ready to implement. And now in a variety of formats um, that can capitalize on this trend. Exactly. So we're going after even just traditional gyms too, we're talking to. So any of these guys that want to digitalize, obviously, yeah, the gym market is the one we understand well. And, you know, because we're not streaming out of a uh, production studio like a Peloton with no windows, very controlled environment, took a long time to be able to combat all these things and automate this process to work really well. And, And so, yeah, all just even, you know, initially we were more studio focused, but now traditional gyms are in play equipment manufacturers that want to stream classes from, you know, their facilities as well to their equipment and, and obviously traditional studios. Yeah. One thing that you mentioned was thinking about the user and that it makes sense for them to want to subscribe to a marketplace and then have access to be able to jump around from different studios, different instructors. And and certainly that ends up benefiting the studios in the long run. Um, Whether or not they have that same perspective is, you know, for debate. Um, But how do you think about user acquisition at this point and, you know, having folks join the platform, marketing to them, um, conveying the, the value proposition, but then, maintaining that retention um given that this is and has been such a technology engineer heavy endeavor to this point as you yep. start to think about what that user side looks like have you thought about what growing that looks like and what piece of that falls to you versus what falls to the studios to help get people on there and, and what that will look like going forward yeah you're totally correct so we've definitely been more focused on on building our anchor in the technology at this point our users have come 60% organically, so through word of mouth or people that are, you know, go to the studio, and then 40% through kind of codes associated with our studio partners. Um, so, you know, our goal, we've tested Facebook ads and pretty successfully been acquiring a user. So uh, upon our next funding, we'll scale and, um, you know, start to start to deploy more traditional marketing tactics. But really for us, the goal is to be able to give the studios a ton of data to be able to tell them, you know, we tell them, you know, Barbara's watching your content 20% of the time. Now she's watching it 40% of the time. Right. So, you know, you're gaining, you're gaining her eyes or, or, or this person's a cardio person and they're kind of moving around, you know, the, you know, cardio perspective. And so to, to pay attention to them. And so we're definitely giving them tons of data to be able to use that and to, to succeed. And then also in the SaaS model, we're not worried about the customer acquisition. We're just worried about the technology, but, but we are also looking to use the knowledge that we have and also be able to help them with that because it's a different marketing um, message than it would be to get somebody into the studio. So, so in both models, we'll still continue to work through customer acquisition. But I think what makes this unique is we're not really um, marketing a new product, right? So the studios exist. They have communities. They have thousands of people that go to them. They have 50 people that are in the classes. Um, so we built like a feature for the studios that when somebody checks in, they could share it with a friend. So obviously it'd be more fun for me to watch you in a yoga class and just, you know, pay attention to you who I know than to watch a stranger. So I think there is a real network effect to this business that's unique to some of the other ones because they're all real people in the class and and the people going to those studios are, you know, diehard people. So now they can kind of share that with the friends. So I think in that aspect, ours is slightly different because we are showing real classes. Yeah, it makes sense. And that, that'll be exciting to see is, you know, the user side and the marketing and the acquisition starts to take up. But also, as we mentioned, it's not wholly dependent on that, which I think is also a smart um, move on your part to be able to to have this diversified product offering. Um, yeah. When you the st- consumer, yeah, the consumer is an expensive uh, game now and there's a lot of people kind of getting into it. So for us, that's sort of how we, yeah, the SaaS model was really a great next step for us because our competition is zero. Our demand is a hundred percent. And, um, you know, the, the customer acquisition game is then on, on the client to do that. Definitely. And thinking about, you know, initially you mentioned having seen the evolution, you know, the, the kind of anecdote that your apartment was right by Peloton and you kind of had a front row seat to, to see what was happening beyond the just kind of sense that you had that something was changing. Um, thinking about, the kind of pushback that you got from in the beginning, uh, assuming that you did from yep. whether that was the user or the studio owner and potentially even investors about the industry and changes that were happening. How have 
those questions and that perception changed from the beginning until now. Uh, and what I'm really trying to get at there is, you know, when you set out to start something from nothing and you're building this business and you have the conviction that, you know, this thing is going to happen and I'm going to do everything I can to be there at the moment as it starts to pop or, or potentially yep. will it to happen if I have to, um, there are various roadblocks and pushback and doubters along the way. And there are things that, you know, to the founder seem obvious and inevitable, but yep. for some reason, you know, the studio owner, the investors, they, they have the, the questions that they want to poke holes in and they want to tell you how the market's never going to be as big as you think it is X, Y, and Z. Yep. How has that changed from, you know, day one, year one, walking into those rooms, whether it's a meeting to get the studio owner on board or potentially raise money from an investor till now? How have the questions changed? How has their kind of perception of the business and industry changed? And, and what does that signify to you? Yeah, I mean, I think Peloton has done a great service for the market from an investor side of the market and consumer side. They've done obviously great marketing. People get it now like, oh, I could take this at home. And, you know, that concept was, you know, they really hammered that home. So from the user perspective, and I think obviously they've got ex investors excited about the space, which is, you know, uh, pretty helpful as well. So I think that they've done a great service. So thank you to that. Um, I think the, you know, investors used to ask a lot of questions. I, I am a pinnacle user of the space. So, so I, you know, I would get questions like, well, would people really watch something on their phone? Like your phone is so tiny and that doesn't seem, I'm like, have you gone to the gym in the spare room because people are propping up their phones and doing this? I'm not speculating that this is going to happen, that people are doing this. Like, you know, when I used to make my pitch, there wasn't really data around streaming. I would more talk about the amount of studios that have risen and the percentage of the revenue in the fitness industry that it now consumes and the stickiness of the product. But I, there wasn't really data around that until recently. So um, even though I knew these things were happening and I was on the forefront of doing these things, it, it wasn't like hard evidence to point to. Um, so that made it difficult in the beginning of this because, because, you know, they were pondering if this was happening and I saw it, but it was still in its early stages. So I think that's been, um, you know, helpful for, for, um, me to be able to have those, you know, hard data to point to and, and to show that. But, and from the studio perspective, I think, you know, there's, they get a lot of things thrown at them. And, you know, I think they feel this, you know, the whole evolution of class pass and everything really kind of, you know, changed the dynamic for them as well. And I think, you know, they're a little shell shocked too. And so they were slow to kind of accept this as they were some other things. And so um, I think it's exciting now that they're catching up to that as well and, and really see the value of being able to stream to you know, to be able to build their audience instead of making money from the 30 bodies or however many can fit in their class. Now the whole world is their audience. And I think from the instructor's perspective, that's really exciting. Right. At this point, it's almost, it's not even a luxury. It's a necessity. And you just have to figure it out and work with that as it continues to, to grow. Yeah. If you don't have digital content, then, then, then your business is only staying in the doors of your business and that's as big as it's going to get. And, and, you know, with streaming, like so, some, one of the most downloaded apps is a girl that, you know, was from Instagram and she doesn't even have a brick and mortar and she has, yeah, one of the most downloaded fitness apps, that girl, Kayla, it signs. I mean, those examples are incredible. And, and these studios that have that brick and mortar presence and have a community should certainly be playing in that game and, and competing with the, with, with those people that have done a great job with, with no brick and mortar. Yeah. I think that's a, a, a pretty good example. They're going to do a hundred million in revenue this year and right? never had a studio. So uh, it worked out pretty well from a content perspective. Exactly. Exactly. And I think like, I, I think that's amazing. And, and, you know, now they're demanding to actually, they have her, she was in Madison Square Garden. I yeah. mean, now they're demanding to see her. So I think that's the reverse. And obviously she was early into the game and good timing and stuff. But from these studios perspective, they have all the other tools, right? They have the facilities to, you know, showcase the people. And that's where I think that, you know, that they're seeing that now. And so that's been super exciting. And from the, like I said, from the trainer's perspective, it's a, I mean, you know, instead of just being limited to 20 people, they have the opportunity to speak to the whole world. So I think that's really empowering for them as well. And the, the good talent wants to be at places that are bringing those opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, wrapping things up and we'll, we'll get you out of here on this. Um, you mentioned a little bit about what's next in terms of the SAS and white label model, 
Um, and that's certainly an exciting development that's coming up soon. Yep. Beyond that, what else are you most excited about right now, whether it's at, at Forte or about the industry or opportunity? Um, what's got you fired up most for the coming months here? Yeah, I think we're really excited to roll out the SaaS opportunity. I think it's going to be a lot of fun to power some of these big brands and, and watch them get their content out there. Um, everyone's always excited when they see their own content. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it, it's, it's super exciting to get that going for us. Obviously from a business perspective, it's the same deployment and process that we're doing. So we feel pretty confident we'll be able to roll that out quickly. Um, we're also really excited to do some work with some of the equipment manufacturers and get, get content streaming on there as well. Um, as that's such an obvious next progression. And yeah, I'm really excited to to watch the market start to take up live streaming. I think, like I said, on-demand video has been accepted and a, a bunch of them have that offering, but but live is where the user is going to demand as they start to be exposed to that experience, which is superior than, than on-demand. It'd be like you know texting on an old cell phone that you had to type on the letter a bunch of times to get the letter to show up. You know That would seem crazy to do nowadays. And so I think on-demand video is going to feel the same way soon and excited to watch that uh, uptick happen in the market. Yeah, a lot of exciting stuff happening, a lot to look forward to. And with that, I'm just grateful that you took the time today and the, the conversation was great. And I think we'll provide a ton of value for listeners. So you know, thanks for Thank joining you. us and we're, we're excited to watch Forte continue to grow. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks everyone for listening to today's episode. For more from Fit Insider, visit insider.fit.co and subscribe to our weekly newsletter for insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Then go ahead and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. See you next time.